Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in to check out this video. This is a removal of a ground nest from a client's house, showing the process from beginning to end. Plus, I'm gonna be explaining the um, process of how these nests are actually founded and the progress throughout the season. And at the very end, I have some shots of my three girls, Ginger, Pigeon, and Angel, consuming the nest. So here's the video, check it out. All right, so this is the opening to the nest. This was a eastern yellow jacket nest in the ground, and the client was actually mowing his grass and had gotten stung and couldn't tell where the nest was, but he saw a bunch of swarming. Um, so I came over there, and the first thing I usually do is when I get to a client's house where they say they have yellow jackets, um, especially if they don't know where they are, um, I look for the in and out trail, so the back and forth that they do from uh, foraging, so that they're going down to the ground, I just follow that line right down to the ground. It's a common question I get in the comments um, when people ask me how I locate these nests. So once I find the nest, I get my stuff set up and I'm you know ready to start moving with it. And um, my ground nest removals always start the same. I put the vacuum nozzle close to the entrance way. I don't just shove it down the hole because um, you're just asking for it to get clogged with dirt and everything else. Plus, you don't know how many are coming out at that point and if you're actually getting them stirred up enough to come out. Um, so I put it about where it's at. Now you'll notice that some of them do fly past the nozzle and that's totally fine. They're going to swarm around, they're going to eventually make their way back into the nozzle and um, so it's another comment that I get in these videos especially for ground nests is that I quote unquote need a bigger vacuum and various other silliness. Um, I don't need a bigger vacuum. This is this vacuum works great for for this type of removal. Um, the reason why some of them actually make it past the nozzle is because they're climbing on the side of the, the dirt wall. And that has nothing to do with like adding an attachment to the um, vacuum, like a wider attachment, because that does not change the suction. The only time the suction is changed is if you add a narrower um, nozzle. And I definitely don't need to do that. So um, no funnels, no wider attachments, nothing like that. This is the best way to do it. So, man, you can see, look at that. Look at all those adults coming out of there. It's nuts. So this was close to the end of season. So there were some new queens coming out. Um, you also notice some males coming out. Um, I don't get any real clear shots of males or queens to be able to distinguish the two for you guys. Um, but I will be having a video coming up in the near future um, showing the differences between them. Because I did save some, uh, some adults from these colonies that I take apart. And I'll be having a wasp comparison like from species to species video coming up in the future so the process is always the same I just spend a lot of time with the nozzle at the entrance way um, none of this is sped up by the way so you're seeing this in real time and um, the amount in this colony was probably close to about 2,000 maybe 20 2,500 somewhere in there it was a good size it was a good size nest it was a good size colony so there are some queens there. You can always notice the queens because they have a little bit darker yellow tinge to their bodies. And they are a little bit more robust. Um, males are often long and slender. They have an extra abdominal segment and they also have an extra antenna segment. So that's kind of how you can tell them apart from the queens. Um, males look more like queens than they do like workers. Um, workers are the smaller of the three different uh, the three different body sizes and styles um, of there's a male there um, that's a male there too um, you can tell males because they have a very, almost like a jet black antenna and they're longer and they're like almost hooked they almost look like ram horns um, males cannot sting males have no ovipositor or stinger um, they can bite so, you know, oftentimes when, when you get stung by a yellow jacket or any other kind of wasp, um, they latch on with their, with their mandibles, so they, they bite you, quote-unquote, but it's mainly just for them to latch on so they can sting you and have leverage to sting you, and then they, they sting you with their abdomen. There's a bunch of males there. Uh, there goes a queen. There's a couple queens there. So this was definitely a, a, a productive nest. So there was already, there's a new queen. Wow, that was a big one. Um, there's another queen. See how big and yellow she is? Or big and orange she is? So these new queens and males would have 
been leaving the nest anyway to, there's a big one would have been leaving the nest anyway to go and, and uh, start a new colony so what happens is the new males and queens they leave the nest and they mate so they can mate in the nest because they can either mate in the nest or leave the nest and then mate um, but they mate within the colony so they don't just go fly off and find a male from another colony um, a lot of incest in these uh, colonies um, so they'll, they'll, they'll mate and then the new queens will venture off and they will be the only ones that will survive the colony um, everyone else dies all the males die all the workers die and the original founding queen dies or mother queen as I refer to her so as to uh, avoid confusion so I'd say about 75% of these adults coming out right now are male and, and queen queens um, queens can sting they have an ovipositor or a stinger I should say and but they are not really aggressive so the only time a queen would really sting you is if you were handling her or um, had her and she flew against your shirt and you leaned up against something she would sting you um, but she's not going to be aggressive so she's not going to really follow the pheromone response to swarm um, really the only ones that will swarm and aggressively attack are the worker females so the hierarchy is such there's a founding queen and she um, goes out and um, finds a new nest and she then starts the colony completely by herself only with the new eggs that were fertilized during the, the past season and so when she goes around the springtime when she finds a nest area that she wants to nest in they do not reuse nests so she will start completely from scratch and she'll start building that colony and the the eggs that she lays will be female workers so she can lay only female eggs because she's been fertilized the only time that she could lay a male egg is if there are eggs that she lays that were not fertilized which that really doesn't happen um, in these colonies there's a little bit of um, dispute as to like how males are laid but I'll get to that in a minute so female workers that come out of um, they're technically considered sterile but they can lay eggs so mammals if they aren't fertilized if, the, if, if a, ma a mammal female does not have uh, does not mate with a male mammal um, they won't be able to have fertilized eggs so that that egg that they pass will not be able to grow into a, an adult mammal but with these types of insects um, wasps in general they they can lay an egg that will develop into an adult even without being fertilized so the queen is the uh, queens are the only ones who can actually mate as far as the females are concerned so they mate and they can then lay female eggs um, so then like towards the end of the season females which are again they are not able to mate the female workers they will then try to, to lay their own eggs in the cells and as the queen is still productive she will police the cells and won't allow the workers to lay any eggs and any eggs that are laid by the workers she will kill them she will kill the eggs um, but then at towards the end of the season when she starts running out of her um, fertilized eggs and then she is kind of seen in the colony to be a bit incompetent or she runs out of the pheromone that, that governs the the colony she'll be killed by the colony and the workers will then wreak havoc laying eggs in the previously used cells um, and all of the worker eggs will turn into males since they're unfertilized eggs so um, now you have queen eggs that were laid by the queen before she died um, or in some cases she hasn't died and she just stops policing the the workers to um, from, from being able to lay eggs um, I've seen it both ways um, so there's new queens that are hatching now what actually makes a queen adult is not a special egg that the queen lays or anything like that it's not distinguishable between a worker and a new queen she will literally just lay an egg in a larger cell that's the only thing that dictates whether or not a larva will be produced into a queen or into a um, just an adult worker you could literally take a standard cell larva out of that and put it into a queen cell or a larger cell and have the adults feed it more and more and more and it will develop into a queen 
So there's no distinguishable difference between the larva. So when people ask, like, how do I know which one's going to be a queen and which one's going to be a, just a female worker, it's solely by which cell it's laid in. So these workers that are laid in regular cells will then develop into worker, worker um, wasps. And sometimes males are laid into worker cells, so you have smaller males. Uh, but for the most part, um, the queen cells will have male workers laid into them. So that's why males will oftentimes be long and slender. They'll be about the same size because they will be fed as um, as much, almost as much as the queens. Um, so the, qu the queen cells with new queen eggs laid inside, new queen larvae start to develop, um, they will start being identified and recognized as females, so they'll be fed more and they'll be giving a little bit more attention than the males will, so they get bigger and more robust. Um, though, like I said, you will see large male work or large males as well, they're just not as common. So then once the, uh, once the queens start hatching and the males start hatching, they kind of tend to stay in the nest. They don't really do much. Um, they don't do any foraging or anything like that. And then finally they do leave the colony and mate and start the colony over. Well, start their own colony the next season. So you see there's a lot of males and things in that nest. And that's a decent sized nest. You think about how big that thing is in the ground. So I did slow this down here in a minute so you guys can get a really good glimpse of it. But there are a lot of big queen cell combs in there. So you can see here, all of the cells you're seeing right now are, are queen cells. They're super large, and then the ones in the back there are smaller worker cells. And the ones that are like having their have their bottom sticking out, they are going down and getting sustenance from larva deep down inside those comb. So this is the base, this is the envelope, and you'll notice that with ground nests particularly, that they have very, very weak structure as far as the, the um, envelope is concerned. And that's because their envelope is made out of this particular species susses out dying, decaying wood to build their envelope out of, as opposed to like bald-faced hornets or German yellow jackets, which will chew on more lively, structured cellulose uh, material. So that's why this stuff's a little bit weaker than the envelope from, say, German yellow jackets or bald faced hornets. So you see all the pebbles in the bottom of the hole? So that's when all, as they start digging, they start exposing more rocks and they just keep undermining those rocks and they keep falling to the bottom of the hole. And if you notice at the top left corner, there's the, the original rodent hole that this nest was started in. So this whole entire excavation was done by the wasps themselves. They didn't just find a random large hole and start, you know, building a nest. They actually dug it out, which I'll explain a little bit later here in this video. So there's the hole there. That's the rodent hole. So that was the original size of this cavity before the wasps started digging it out and building their nest. And then when I'm done, I just pack the hole back in with soil, and that way... Um, any returning foragers and things won't really have anywhere to go. Um, they try to hide in every nook and cranny they can at that point, but um, this is just to try to, you know, mainly just to fill back in the hole with all the soil that was dug out, but most of the soil has already been dug out by the wasps and carried off and dropped in the yard or dropped further away from this site. So I never have enough soil to actually fill back in the hole. So I wanted to take a few minutes just to show you guys nests and how they're founded and how they grow over the course of a season. This will kind of give you guys a little bit of an idea how this all starts. So this is a new queen from a colony I just recently excavated. This is a southern yellow jacket queen. So this girl would have hatched this year and then found her way into a bit of shrubbery or brush, leaves, a log, whatever, and would then uh, overwinter in that foliage and stay warm enough to where she would be able to come out, uh, emerge in the spring, 
and start her own colony. And how that would start is, this new queen would fly out and go like, fly along the ground, look for anything that looked like a, a hole. <laughs> That's what she said. That's what he said. So she'll look for anything that looks like a hole that she can potentially start a nest in. So she flies along, she finds this little hole, and she goes in, she explores. So she crawls in that hole, and she says, you know what, that's a good place, I'm gonna, build a, I'm gonna start building my nest right there. So she comes out, and she starts flying around, she finds some uh, cellulose on some trees, um, she gets some sustenance from maple syrup, like some sap from a maple tree or sap from a ch wild cherry tree. So she gets some energy, um, some spring f blooming flowers like daffodil. She'll, she'll pollinate those by flying into those and getting some nectar. She'll go chew on some wood on like a fence post or something. And then she comes back into this hole and she starts building her comb. So she starts with that little tiny bit of comb there. And then... She continues her foraging, getting her sustenance, because she doesn't have any larvae to feed her. Um, so then she starts digging out a little bit. So she's already built the comb, or part of the comb, and she already started laying some eggs. And uh, so she starts digging out and excavating out that tunnel so it can make more room for a larger nest. So then down here... So these eggs that were initially laid in here to be the brood start turning into larvae. So then she starts feeding the larvae, um, she starts hunting insects, and she kills the insects, brings them back and feeds them to the larvae, and now they start acting like an external stomach. They digest those solids, and then they regurgitate a fluid, which then feeds her, so that she doesn't have to go out flying and finding flowers anymore, so that's one less step she has to take. So then, as this brood starts to develop, they start weaving their silk caps, and eventually they hatch, and then these new workers, or daughters, emerge. So any, any fertile egg that is laid by the queen will become a female worker, which is pretty much a direct clone from her. So those female workers then emerge. Two days later, their wings are dry and they can start flying out and foraging on their own, collecting cellulose to keep building the nest. They will continue to dig down and make this cavity bigger for a larger nest. So then they start excavation. So now these more and more adults start hatching, more combs being built, more envelope is being built around the comb, and they continue to keep digging. And they dig and dig and dig. So that excavation just increases, it skyrockets. So now there's, any rocks that are in this dirt and the soil is dropped to the bottom of the hole and they keep digging, keep undermining those rocks. So that's why there's a lot of rocks left in the bottom of the, of the, uh, the cavity after I pull out those nests because all those rocks just keep getting undermined and keep dropping to the bottom of the hole. So then towards the end of the season, so this is all started in May. This new queen emerging starting in PA starts in May. So by the time Late September, early October, it is a full-term nest. It is potentially reproductive, meaning there's been new queens and new males that are starting to hatch and getting ready to mate. Those are called reproductives. So in this hole, this hole is as big as it's going to get, this cavity, and that nest is at full term, meaning most of the um, queens and males have been laid and started hatching. And... Once they start, those new queens and males hatched and started to mate, they then leave the nest and it starts all over again. So that new queen that is now fertile will then go out and winter, winter over, hiding underneath brush, foliage, logs, does this sound familiar? And getting ready for hibernation until next year when she can emerge and do the same process that her mom did at the year previous and start a new colony all over again. So this bucket weighs
58.2 pounds. Alright, dump this in. Not gonna be the most accurate just because there's some pebbles in here and rocks are denser than soil. Well, it was kind of dome shaped, so we're gonna pull out the guesstimation. All right, so let's weigh this out. Thirty-three point eight. So it comes out to twenty-four point four pounds of soil that those yellow jackets excavated out of there. Holy crap! All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in to check out this video. If you guys enjoyed this content, drop in the comments and let me know what you think. If you guys have any suggestions for any future videos coming up, just drop in the comments as well. Just let me know. Um, if you guys haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so and hit the subscribe button down below. And if you guys like to get any updates from when I do my video uploads, just hit the bell notifications. That way you guys can get notified of those. If you guys are continued subscribers, thanks so much for tuning in to check out my videos and supporting my channel. And I'll catch you guys on the next.